Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our community session, which will provide an update on the Environment Effects Statement or EES process for the Western Victoria Transmission Network project. My name is Catherine. I'm the Major Developments Community Engagement Officer at Mirable Shire Council, and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that make up Mirable Shire, the Wadarung, Wurundjeri and Jarjarung peoples, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Due to current restrictions, we must run this session virtually from our own homes, so please bear with us if any technical difficulties come up. Our hope is that this session will empower our community members and provide valuable information on how they can contribute to the EES process for the Western Victoria Transmission Network project. So we will begin this session with a presentation from our expert guest, Jack Crone, that addresses many of the questions that we've received from the community in the lead up to this session. After that, we'll have the opportunity for live Q&A with those of you who are tuned in. Your microphones are muted, but you can submit your questions via the question box on the right hand side of your screen. We'll try to address as many of them as possible, but we ask that you please keep in mind that any project specific questions about the transmission line should be directed to Osnet services and we can help facilitate that for you offline. Otherwise, Jack will respond as best he can from an AES process perspective. So let's get to it. I am delighted to welcome back Jack Crone, Senior Impact Assessor at the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Thank you very much, Catherine, and uh, and thank you to the for the opportunity to join you this evening. Uh, I'd also like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands across which we're meeting. In my case, it's the um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging and to elders or members of any other traditional owner groups who may be with us this evening. Um, just for those who don't know me, I've been working in environmental impact assessment for 30 odd years in uh, DELP and its predecessor departments. Um, and that work essentially focuses on the processes that support the Minister for Planning to be able to deliver the best possible advice to decision makers out of the EES process. So we we'll go on to the next one, Catherine, please. Thank you. So um, a little bit just about the um, historical context of, of the EES process. Um, it, the first environmental impact assessment legislation was the National Environmental Policy Act in the United States, which went through Congress in 1969. And, and that reflected that that was, a, you know, the 1960s was an era of rising environmental consciousness. Some of you might be familiar with Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, which was a, a really sort of seminal moment in 1962, but a lot of other environmental uh, legislation emerged out of the 1970s, including our own Environment Protection Act. So environmental impact assessment was, was essentially conceived as a process to uh, reduce the risk of the, the sort of unexpected, we never thought that would happen outcomes to projects, often predominantly public works projects, public sector projects. Um, a lot of those projects in those days didn't require the statutory approvals that uh, pub private sector projects require these days um, and the decisions that were being informed were often decisions about taking a project forward or allocating funding for a project. But I guess the other decision maker that is involved in all of these processes is the actual proponent who's got a constant series of decisions to make about the way in which they wish to configure the project, the way they wish to take it forward. So nowadays we have environmental impact assessment legislated um, across countries and subnational jurisdictions around the world. Um, every state in Australia conducts environmental impact assessment and we have the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which provides for that at a national level as well. So if we go to the next one, um, we have in Victoria, the Environment Effects Act, 
which applies to uh, projects that are capable of having a significant effect on the environment. Um, our act is quite short and a lot of the detail about how the process works is in ministerial guidelines. Um, the term environment is defined in the guidelines and defined broadly as covering aspect, you know, covering human surroundings essentially. So not just the biophysical, but the economic, the social, the cultural, the heritage and so forth. Uh, for most, um, most of our impact assessment is done through the process of an environment effects statement. Um, we have, I think at the moment, about 18 projects at some point along the way of going through the EES process in Victoria. Um, they include, as well as Western um, Transmission Project, they include uh, roads, railway projects, water projects, um, gas projects, there's a mountain bike project in there, so quite a variety of different types of projects. For each project, the Minister issues uh, project specific scoping requirements which work in a complementary way with the ministerial guidelines to guide the process and lead to an integrated assessment. One thing to bear in mind with the ES process and this is common to many environmental impact assessment um, systems is that it doesn't generate an approval of its own. It generates a minister's assessment, which is provided to the authorities that have statutory responsibilities to make decisions about the project and would have those statutory responsibilities even if there weren't an AES. So go on to the next one, which has got a um, the first of two flowcharts. This is the nice simple flowchart that maps out the AES process, but could be uh, could essentially be seen as mapping out the environmental impact assessment process pretty much anywhere around the world. So it provides for a project or a proposal to be brought to the minister's attention through a referral. The minister makes a decision about the level of assessment required. Scoping is the impact assessment jargon for working out what the coverage of the studies ought to be. For the Western Vic project, we are currently at the preparing stage, which is the, the phase of the process where the proponent is responsible for preparing the environment effects statement. Public review is essentially exhibition, so the, the point where there is a formal opportunity for um, interested parties to make submissions about the, uh, the project. Uh, the assessment is uh, the final outcome of the process and its purpose is to inform decisions that the proponent must make and also the decisions that the authorities who are responsible for approvals must make. And as I said, for Western Vic, we are currently at the, at the preparing stage. So if we go on to the next one, um, as I said, the responsibility for preparing the AES rests with the proponent under the Act. Um, the process, our role in managing the process is essentially to ensure that the proponent is able to prepare a quality AES addressing the scoping requirements. Uh, one of the things that we do is convene a technical reference group, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we also issue draft scoping requirements for public comment. This happened um, 12 months ago. Um, the Minister considers the submissions. In the case of the Western Vic project, we had over 100 submissions on the draft scoping requirements. The final scoping requirements were issued at the end of last year and they're up on our website. The proponent is also responsible for preparing and implementing a consultation plan um, to provide opportunities to inform the community and to receive and respond to feedback from the community throughout the period of preparing the AES. Pardon me, and preparing an AES can take, um, well, you know, commonly in excess of 18 months. Sometimes we have AESs still in the preparation phase three or four years after the Minister's decision to require an AES. Uh, in this case also, and it, this is the case for probably most of the AESs in preparation at the moment, 
The projects have the project has been identified as what's called a controlled action under the Commonwealth legislation, the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. The AES process is accredited under a bilateral agreement for the assessment purposes of the EPBC Act, which essentially means that the Victorian Minister's assessment will be provided to the Commonwealth Minister for her consideration in terms of determining whether and under what conditions approval would be granted. Um, the technical reference group, which is on the next slide, as um, I said, I would come back to that. Uh, it's something that we establish for each AES and its role is to help us and to help the proponent understand the needs of the particular AES and to make sure that technically there is the best advice going to the proponent and to us on that preparation. Uh, it comprises the authorities, um, so those who will have statutory decisions to make and also uh, government agencies that have expertise which is relevant to the matters that the, the, the particular AES will need to investigate. So it's, it provides an engagement avenue which is complementary to what the proponent is expected to do under its consultation plan. Uh, it's there to provide advice, it's there to provide guidance, but the responsibility for the preparation of the AES remains with the proponent. The bread and butter, if you like, of a TRG is providing uh, common comments on drafts. So, um, and you know, I guess uh, a big part of that is uh, is getting the red pen out or whatever the equivalent of the red pen is on a computer, um, and providing comments on draft scoping requirements on the proponents' consultation plan. Uh, the main one is probably in terms of the. The workload for the TRG is commenting on specialist consultant reports on biodiversity or water or noise or landscape, whatever the case may be, and ultimately providing comment on the draft chapters, the content of the environment effects statement itself. TRG is also there to provide advice and input to us and to the proponent on uh, policy matters that are relevant to the AES, on legislation, and other contextual stuff. So for instance, we um, we got a new Environment Protection Act that came into effect uh, in the middle of this year. So that EPA is on the TRG and one of the things we look to EPA to do through the TRG is keep the TRG informed about the changes in that legislation and the implications that that may have for the project or the assessment of the project. Um, where statutory approvals are required uh, that have procedural requirements of their own. We look to integrate those with the AES process to make the process as simple and as accessible for everybody. And that's a that's an important part of the uh, the role of the TRG as well. Uh, and the material which is provided to the TRG is provided in draft form. Ultimately, it will in its final form uh, will provide will form part of the exhibition package for the AES, but that review process is conducted in, in confidence to enable um, material to be reviewed and addressed really rigorously. So if we go on to the next one that talks about public review, um, at the point where the proponent believes they've completed the AES to uh, a satisfactory degree, uh, they provide it to the minister who considers it um, for authorisation to exhibit. Uh, if the minister is satisfied that it represents an adequate response to the scoping requirements and the ministerial guidelines, uh, which is not to say that the minister is persuaded by the arguments that the AES may contain in favour of the project, but it means that the minister is satisfied that the kite is suitable to fly. Uh, it can be then exhibited for public comment. Um, anybody who is interested may make a submission at that time. As I said, if there are statutory approvals for the project, the procedures for those are integrated with exhibition of the AES. Uh, the Minister appoints the Act and allows the Minister to appoint an inquiry. Uh, he can do that with the approval of the Governor and Council and that inquiry is appointed to review the submissions, to review the AES 
and to conduct a hearing uh, where submitters may choose to be heard and ultimately to provide a written report to the minister to inform uh, and assist the minister to make the minister's assessment. Um, when the minister issues his assessment, that's published on the um, department website along with the report of the inquiry. Um, as a general rule of thumb, from the point where exhibition of an AES commences to the point where the minister is in a position to make an assessment is of the order of six months. Um, it can commonly be longer uh, if the hearing needs to be more than about three weeks long because of the number of people who wish to make submissions. Uh, we have had a couple of AESs in recent years where the hearings have gone for of the order of eight weeks or even longer. So that's that's all part of that um, process. Obviously, if that runs across um, the, the major Christmas holiday period, that, that extends the, the period as well. So if we go on to the next slide, um, the Minister's assessment is the final thing that comes out of the EES process. It's really important to understand that when we talk about the EES process, it's that whole process. It's not, not just the EES. Uh, the guidelines set a target, the ministerial guidelines set a target timeline for the Minister to issue his assessment within 25 business days of receiving the inquiry's report. That is sometimes quite challenging, but it's the, the timeline that we try to work to in order to brief the minister to be able to make an assessment. And the minister's assessment focuses essentially on are the environmental effects of the project acceptable? Are there modifications to the project required to enable acceptable environmental effects to be achieved? Um, the minister sends his assessment to the proponent and the decision makers and decision makers are obliged to consider the minister's assessment in making their decisions. And as I said, the inquiry report will be published at the same time as the minister's assessment. So I've got one more slide, which is um, a slightly more complicated flowchart than the first one, but hopefully it's, it's easy enough to follow. So we go through that screening process at the beginning where the minister considers a referral and decides, and this, this essentially is the flowchart that says the minister's decided an AES is required. Then there is the scoping process. The minister issues scoping requirements having considered community inputs. The proponent prepares the AES in the context of the proponent's AES consultation plan, which um, involves engagement with the community in in a, um, a, a tailored way uh, relevant to that project. Uh, exhibition of the AES happens again with community inputs and those community inputs and the AES go to the inquiry. Uh, in this case, as in many cases, it will be also an advisory committee, um, but for the purposes of the Environment Effects Act, it's called an inquiry. The inquiry considers the AES, the submissions, what it, the, which is to say the written submissions, whatever it hears from submitters who wish to be heard and whatever other information may be tabled in the course of the hearing. Uh, it reports to the minister and the minister issues his assessment and sends that to the statutory decision makers and to the proponent and publishes it. So that's the AES process, the AES is an important component of that, but it is by no means the only component and it, it needs to be seen in that overall context. So I think maybe I'll leave the, the formal side of the presentation there, Catherine, and um, happy to respond to the questions that may have come in. Thank you, Jack. Uh, we'll now move on to our question and answer session with those of you joining us live today. So please go ahead and type in your questions in the question box on the right hand side of your screen. To begin, we will go through the questions that were submitted prior to the session and then move on to live questions. If we run out of time to answer them all, Jack is more than happy to follow up with a written response for you offline. 
So the first question we have is um, relating to biodiversity, and we've had a couple of these, so I'll read both of them to you, Jack. Yep. The first one is, um, how are Osnet going to protect the bird life over Lake Miramu? The second question is, the transmission line is slated to go through the Bolwara area where there are significant forested areas. Recent harvesting of timber on a private plantation in Bolwara resulted in the deaths of at least three koalas. The abundant wildlife in this area has been pointed out to Osnet on many occasions, but has not resulted in an alteration to the proposed route of the transmission line. Will the EES take this into account? Okay, so um, biodiversity is one of the values that um, the EES needs to investigate and report on and that the proponent needs to consider how whatever the effects uh, might be can be mitigated. Um, I can't comment on what the specific mitigation measures might be in particular places or with respect to particular species, but in general terms, as to the extent that the AES identifies potential adverse effects on particular environmental values, it also needs to present the proponent's intended approach to mitigating those effects and explain what the, uh, the nature and the magnitude of, of what we call the residual impact will be. Um, the SPED technical specialists, part of their role in preparing their reports is to offer recommendations about possible mitigation measures. Um, their role is to provide advice so they don't make the decisions about which mitigation measures the proponent will commit to, um, but uh, and the proponent is expected to arrive at those having regard to the whole project. Uh, so sometimes um, the quick and simple solution to one one particular problem may actually make another problem worse. So we expect proponents to take a sort of systems based approach to identifying an integrated package of mitigation measures. Um, but the, and those mitigation measures potentially if, if a project is ultimately um, approved in light of an AES process, those mitigation measures will often be captured as obligations in the form of approvals conditions. So I'm, I think it's it's there's a system for dealing with um, mitigation and dealing with the the sorts of impacts that may be identified, um, but at a very at those very specific levels, um, it'll be in the in the final package. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, Osnet benefit financially from this project, so shouldn't the EES be undertaken by an independent body? It is hard for stakeholders and community to trust a process that will negatively impact them if it is facilitated by the company who will benefit. Yeah, okay, thank you. So this comes back um, and perhaps when if we can duck back to the last slide in the presentation, Catherine, um, the Act, the Environment Effects Act is quite clear that the responsibility for preparing the Environment Effects Statement rests with the proponent and that is common to environmental impact assessment um, systems around the world it's it's a it's quite a standard part of it and it reflects the fact that one of the parties which is expected to be informed by and respond to the information that emerges out of the studies is the proponent um, so that obligation sits with the proponent but this is where i'd like to really sort of stress that distinction between the environment effects statement as a particular component of the process and the AES process, which is the holistic thing that includes the community uh, engagement opportunities, the public submissions, the inquiry and ultimately the minister's assessment. And the proponent 
has a role in participating in the process and an important role in preparing the environment effects statement, but it is not responsible for managing or facilitating the EES process. The responsibility for administering the process uh, rests with, with DELP um, under the Minister for Planning. So at the end of the day, what comes out is the minister's assessment. It's not the proponent's assessment. And you know, on there are a number of occasions over the years where there have been minister's assessments which have concluded that projects would have unacceptable effects and ought not to proceed. And there are also quite a number of occasions where projects uh, have been supported or, or found to have acceptable effects provided they're modified in certain ways. And I guess the, the other point is that commonly uh, the project that is presented in an exhibited AES is different from the project that the proponent thought they were putting together uh, when the referral was made. And again, that's the process working as the proponent responds to that information. So uh, the Act has been there since 1978. The Act says that the responsibility for preparing the statement rests with the proponent and the way we manage the process acknowledges that that is part of the process, but also manages it in a way to make sure that the inputs of other stakeholders are given due weight in leading up to informing the Minister's assessment. Thank you. So the next question we have has two parts, so I'll just read them one at a time. So the first part is what happens if the project isn't approved by the government through the EES? Can the proponent come back and have another chance? Right. Um, so again, as I said it early on, the EES, the end of the EES process is an assessment and the decisions about approvals are made by the authorities um, who receive and consider the minister's assessment. Um, but if the pro if a project receives, you know, let's say a, an unfavourable assessment, um, when we get to the point where the minister makes an assessment, that is the end of the EES process. Um, there's no provision for the minister to uh, revise or vary or amend an assessment. So if a project receives an unfavourable assessment, um, it would need then the proponent to take on board whatever uh, the information, whatever the conclusions are in that assessment and work out whether it is possible to reconfigure the project in a way that can perhaps still achieve the project objectives, but respond um, strongly and effectively to the concerns that led to the, un, the unfavourable assessment. Um, it, it has happened on one occasion in the past, which was for um, the Big Hill open cut gold mine proposal at Stall. There were two AESs for similar um, project objectives separated by 12 or 14 years. Um, the second project when it was referred to the minister acknowledged the issues that had led to an unfold that sort of underpinned the unfavourable assessment when the when the first EES was done. Um, but it, it's still the second one still received an unfavourable assessment, but for um, for different reasons. But the project had been changed to respond to the things that had uh, led to that conclusion the first time around. So it's open to a proponent to try to reconfigure the project and address those matters. But a project once assessed, that's that's been assessed. What, one thing that is open to the minister um, at any time after the EES has been completed and before he makes his assessment is to uh, ask the proponent to prepare what the Act calls a supplementary statement. Again, this is quite uncommon and um, 
you know, it's happened a couple of times in the last 20 years, but it's certainly not a common um, contingency. But if the minister is going to ask for a supplementary statement, he has to do so before he has made his assessment because he then has the original statement plus the supplementary statement to inform his assessment. Um, so that happened, for instance, for Port Phillip Bay channel deepening. Um, it happened, I think, for the Shepparton Bypass project, which is going back the best part of 20 years. Uh, but that has to inform the assessment um, because for each AES and for each decision that the minister makes that an AES is required, there is only one assessment. And I think there's another part to the question. Yes, so second half of the question is, do you pick panel members to make sure they understand the impact of the project and don't carry any biases? Okay, so the, the selection of the inquiry members um, is something that is managed directly through Planning Panels Victoria, um, but Planning Panels Victoria essentially provides advice to the minister. Um, and there's two steps because the minister first requires the approval of the governor in council to appoint the inquiry and then has to make the appointment. The members of the inquiry are selected for their collective technical expertise relevant to the key issues that the AES is raising in terms of um, that broad definition of environment. So there may well be, depending on the nature of the project and the nature of its impacts, the inquiry members might include people with planning expertise, with biodiversity, um, landscape and visual, geology. There's, there's you know, almost infinite array of possibilities. Um, inquiry, potential inquiry members, um, have to confirm that they have no conflict of interest and that's that's a, an ongoing and very important concern that the the members of the inquiry are coming at it with independence as well as expertise. Thank you Jack. So the next few questions um, relate to undergrounding the, the transmission line and we had a lot of questions along the same topics. So I'm just going to read out the few that represent, you know, the broad um, topics that people wanted us to cover. So the first one is, could you please clarify why feasible alternatives and alternative options as required by the EES did not include an underground HVDC alternative as opposed to HVAC? This alternative raised through public and stakeholder consultation and an independent scoping report offers significant potential for superior environmental outcomes. Okay, um, so the, the scoping requirements for this AES are, uh, include a section on um, consideration of alternatives, which is um, somewhat lengthier and uh, more detailed than is commonly the case. However, the scoping requirements are not intended to be prescriptive to the extent of um, setting out a list of things which implies that anything on the list doesn't need to be looked at. So as far as the question of undergrounding is concerned, uh, undergrounding is identified as one of the possible alternatives that might deliver uh, an environmentally superior outcome for this project uh, and that is to be investigated in the best way that the proponent can. Um, now there may be, and uh, from my recollection of some of the submissions on the scoping requirements, there were multiple um, possible configurations of what an undergrounded transmission line might look like and what sorts of technology it might embrace. Um, the scoping requirements don't choose to prioritise any one of those over any other. Um, they put the onus onto the proponent to carry out those investigations. Uh, however, the detail and 
take back a step. I mentioned that we got over 100 submissions on the scoping requirements, some of which were very detailed and, and go to went to a depth of detail beyond what would be prescribed in scoping requirements. However, the, the substance of all of those submissions was passed on to the proponent. So all of the information and all of the questions that people raised in those scoping, re scoping requirement submissions has been provided to the proponent. So the submissions which talked about uh, quite a range of different um, technological configurations that might be useful or might be applicable to undergrounding, all of that was shared with the proponent and ultimately the onus will be on the proponent in investigating undergrounding and explaining that investigation in the AES will have to demonstrate that the undergrounded options that they have looked at are the most appropriate and and the ones that are best able to uh, approach that notion of feasibility and uh, superior environmental outcomes. Thank you, Jack. Um, so another undergrounding question. Uh, at what stage during the EES process can a project be altered to meet the wishes of the people directly affected by it? For example, the proposal is for an overhead transmission line, whereas current comment would suggest the community preference is for an underground transmission line. Yeah, um, so th this, uh, this EES, uh, as I understand it, has um, has its origins in a, in a process um, which led to a, a contractual obligation for Osnet as the proponent um, to pursue a project. And the way that project was configured at that time is in the context of an overhead. So that's what they sort of signed up for. Uh, the minister's scoping requirements have identified a, a, a range of things that may offer alternatives that, you know, as I said, we talk about alternatives that are feasible and alternatives that could deliver a better environmental outcome or a superior environmental outcome. Um, those need to be investigated for the purposes of the EES. If it emerges at any stage during the preparation of the EES that there are potential benefits associated with alternatives, whether they're explicitly mentioned in the scoping requirements or not, um, the expectation is that the proponent will investigate those in good faith and identify the potential um, benefits and adverse impacts, if there are adverse impacts that would need to be balanced. Um, there is a, a phase to come, which is the exhibition of the EES, where um, you know, in some recent cases we've had in excess of a thousand submissions. Sometimes those submissions will raise matters that may not have been brought to the proponent's attention or raised during the preparation of the EES. It's still incumbent on the proponent to respond to those at that time as well. It's obviously not ideal for things to be emerging out of left field at that stage, um, and we hope that the proponent's able to identify and evaluate all of the, the reasonable, feasible um, alternatives in the course of preparing the AES. But every AES, I guess, starts at a point in time and with uh, a level of understanding, at least in the proponent's mind, of what they think the project is intended to achieve. And that needs to be um, the touchstone that they go back to uh, all the time in evaluating those alternatives as to their feasibility and their ability to deliver the uh, the project objectives and with within the bounds of um, acceptable environmental outcomes. Thank you, Jack. And this is the last question from the bunch of questions that were submitted prior to the session. Um, which is how do Osnet intend to manage any disaster that may eventuate as a result of their mitigations being ineffective? For example, bushfires that may be sparked by the transmission line. When preventing measures such as undergrounding would have totally eliminated that risk. Um, 
So I think the expectation is that the ES will present and explain the level of um, impact associated, the, the levels associated with all the potential impacts that the project may raise. Um, there are some impacts associated with projects which are, if you like, inevitable if the project is to go ahead, such as the removal of vegetation around the footings of construction sites. Um, there are other impacts which have an element of uncertainty around them or you know, if you like an element of risk. Um, they're still impacts, they still need to be addressed, they still need to be acknowledged and uh, those risk events often go through um, a sort of risk assessment component to arrive at a conclusion about the level of impact that they relate to because those events have um, a level of likelihood which which may be able to be managed and a level of consequence which may or may not also be able to be managed or mitigated. They still need to be considered as impacts and they will be considered through the assessment process as impacts in light of what the proponent offers up as its understanding based on its investigations of the way that those risks can be managed and what comes in from the community um, which may or may not agree with the proponent's views. Ultimately the assessment will take account of all that information and I can't obviously um, foreshadow what the outcome will be but I, I guess what I would want to do is, is assure everybody that those um, risk related impacts are just as valid and just as relevant to the assessment process as you know perhaps the more um, if you like the more straightforward impacts associated with uh, visual impact or, or whatever. Thank you. Um, now we will open up questions that have been published in the live Q&A. So the first one we have is how can the EES process be fair to community members when the proponent is able to keep important elements of the project secret until too close to the submission date for people to adequately respond? For example, the precise route, size of towers, etc. The confidentiality associated with the TRG is, exacerbates this problem. Um, so the material which is presented to the TRG is, is presented in draft form. Um, that information will ultimately be included in the exhibited EES, but we also expect that as that information is um, revised and validated, that the proponent will share information with the, with the community in the course of its uh, delivering its consultation plan. However, until information is in that final form, it's not final, so it does, it does take time. This EES started with a area of interest, which is uh, a very broad area with a, with a couple of bookends, if you like, at Bulgana and at Sydenham. Um, but a space between them that was you know, varied from a few kilometres to upwards of 20 kilometres in width. Uh, from a pure point of view in terms of impact assessment, that starting with that broad area and the proponents seeking to identify from its perspective the best route between the bookends is a better form of process than a proponent starting with a selected alignment and then being pushed to consider variations to that alignment. There are swings and roundabouts because there is uh, an element of uncertainty about having the process of the proponent arriving at its preference happening in the context of the ES process because at the start no one can say where that line will be um, and until the proponent identifies its preferred line none of us knows what that line will be so that that element of uncertainty is um, can bring 
challenges with it and I absolutely appreciate that that's the case. But at the same time, um, proponents who come out with a linear project saying, right, this is the line we want to go with and then seeking to defend that against whatever information emerges is, is also not probably um, an ideal way of proceeding. At the point of exhibition, all of the information in its final form will be available, but we do expect proponents to make information available to community and stakeholders as it gets to a point where it is sufficiently final and sufficiently definitive to be useful. Um, but the material that comes to the TRG, you know, and has come to the TRG to this point is not information that is in that final form. Um, much of what has come to the TRG has been in a phased form where the the first part of the, the package that comes is essentially a descriptive package about existing conditions uh, and the impact assessment comes only after the existing conditions have been revised and reviewed and, and try to make sure that the, um, the base for evaluating impacts is, is a sound base. So it does take time. This is a, a, a complicated project. It's a very extensive piece of geography with um, a, a massive array of information that needs to be gathered and uh, the nature of a, of a process like this is that that does take time uh, and it's not possible to share definitive information with uh, stakeholders until that definitive information has been finalised. Thank you. So moving on to our next question, some of the field studies for flora and fauna had limited windows for investigation. If the proponent missed these windows, are they required to investigate again at a later date or can the proponent make assumptions, i.e. for migratory birds? Yeah, um, one of the um, one of the challenges for any project, I guess, in um, in Victoria is that we have um, variable climatic conditions and uh, quite a lot of our wildlife is um, is mobile in response to variations in climatic conditions. So the field investigations that a proponent undertakes for an EES, um, however thorough they might be, um, they're still, if you like, a snapshot at a point in time. And while gathering that field information about the specific location of a project is absolutely important and needs to be done to uh, the best standard that it can be, that information is also treated in the context of database information that's available through things like the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, which has information about distribution and records of species uh, going back decades. And that that helps to place the field investigations in a good context. If you go out into the field um, and search for a species and you find it, then that gives you some really important information about where that species was and how common it was and, and how it was using the habitat. If you go out and you don't find a species, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate that the species isn't there, nor does it necessarily demonstrate that the species is never there. So any field investigations for biodiversity that are carried out for an AES are always looked at in the context of the available database information. As I mentioned, the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, there are um, databases, for instance, that BirdLife Australia maintains in terms of birds. Uh, and there's often also information available um, that proponents are expected to, to look for through uh, community organisations and landowners who know, know things about the, the flora and fauna that are on their properties. And, and the things that they have seen over time. So 
it's important to get the best field data that can be gathered, but if um, if there are gaps in that, there are still uh, those important database uh, resources that, that need to be interrogated as well. And that probably applies to uh, things other than biodiversity also. There, there's there's uh, a lot of information around, for instance, about uh, heritage, which is in registers and databases um, that the proponents field work is in, pardon me, oh, excuse me, uh, the proponents field work is intended to complement that rather than um, rather than just start from scratch. Thank you. That was a very interesting answer. <laughs> I, I do tend to talk too much about biodiversity because it is one of my own interest areas. <laughs> Not at all. OK, the last the well, last for now, unless some more come in. Question is, is the EES concerned with project costs or only superior environmental outcomes? Unlike the RIT T, which by comparison has no regard for socioeconomic or environmental impacts. Okay, well, um, the EES process is, as I said, it, it, we we have a definition of environment in the ministerial guidelines, which is very broad and which encompasses um, social and cultural and economic aspects of the surroundings of people as well as the, the biophysical um, environment. Um, so to, I guess, project costs are part of that economic picture, um, but there are other aspects to the economic environment as well, such as employment and tourism and so forth. So all of those things uh, to the extent that they're relevant in a particular case may be really important in the uh, in the proponents investigations for an AES. Um, cost is important in terms of um, project feasibility, I guess, uh, and we certainly expect the proponent to be uh, clear about the economic information that is relevant to the project and the way it's been configured, um, but it, it's in that broader context of um, economics as part of the environment within which a project is proposed to be located. Is that sort of covered it, Catherine, or have I lost the thread of the question? No, I think you've covered what the intention of the question is. Um, the person who posted that question, feel free to post another if you didn't quite um, get what you were looking for. Um, we do have another, one other question that's come in. Uh, so the question is, Osnet clearly knows enough about which towers, etc. it is planning to use in order to, to commission its own expert review of the impact of the project on agriculture that is happening now. Why shouldn't the community have access to that information so that we can commission our own study? Getting the information at the point of exhibition is too late to do so. Um, I don't know. I think that there's a question in there that probably needs to be taken up with Osnet as to where they're up to in terms of um, arriving at preferred positions about particular aspects of what the infrastructure might comprise. Uh, I don't know whether they have arrived at those at conclusions about that or not. Um, I would certainly encourage the questioner to talk to Osnet about what options it is considering and what its timelines are for sharing preferences about those options with stakeholders. I absolutely understand the desire to be able to get a handle on um, the nature of the infrastructure and you know whether that's from perspective of visual impact or impact on um, land use or, or whatever the case may be um, but I, I can't comment on on where the proponent might be up to with arriving at those conclusions and I guess the reality is that until 
um, until the AES is put on exhibition. Um, those those sorts of aspects of the project are still subject to variation. So they may, even if they arrive at a sort of provisional preference at a point in time, that, that may yet change between that point in time and when the AES goes on exhibition. Um, there's there's often a lot more to the um, the proponents evaluation of potential ways of achieving a project's objectives than is is necessarily apparent from from the outside. But I, I could only encourage the questioner to um, to take that up with the proponent and and seek. Um, the best advice that they can, that the proponent can supply about the, the nature of the infrastructure that they're looking at at this point. Thank you, Jack. Yes, I think the, the message there is that even though the, the documents that are being prepared are still in draft form, at any time, community members are more than welcome to approach Osnet with any specific questions that they have to get the information that they're after. Absolutely, I um, encourage people with uh, specific questions or or with information that they believe ought to be taken into account in the preparation of the EES to um, to be proactive about uh, raising those matters with the proponent, um, and we we expect proponents to uh, to treat that information. Um, with due weight and to treat those requests appropriately. Um, so yes, please uh, feel free to approach Osnet. I expect that they would um, they would deal with those matters as they should. Thank you. And I'm going to squeeze in one last question because we have a couple more minutes. Um, so. Our final question is one of our residents is a member of the Osnet CCG group, which is the community consultation group. Yeah. Um, it has been raised many times that Osnet needs to report to the group on underground HVDC options, and it continues to get deflected and suggested that Osnet will report soon on this at a later date. But so far, this still hasn't happened. The Osnet CCG seems to be just Osnet ticking a box and not actively listening to the concerned members. What is the reason Osnet does not bother to have it? Sorry, um, let me rephrase that. What is the reason Osnet even bothers to have a CCG if they are not listening to the members? Does DELP see the minutes of these meetings? Um, Apologies, that was a long one. <laughs> yes. Um, and starting at the back end, I can't recall whether we've seen the minutes, but I, I have. I did see minutes for a couple of meetings early on, but I, it's not something that I've particularly asked for. Um, a CCG as such is not something that we uh, routinely require proponents to establish or run with. It's part of the um, community EES consultation plan for this EES, but it's not necessarily something that would work for every EES. Uh, in terms of the specific information about undergrounding, um, again, that's that's something to uh, I would encourage people to continue to raise that with Osnet. My expectation is that the work is happening and that it will be reported when it's in a form that it's suitable to be shared more broadly. Um, as I said, undergrounding is identified in the scoping requirements as something that needs to be investigated and that will have to be done for the ES to be able to be um, placed on public exhibition. Um, but exactly when that will happen, I can't, uh, I can't say at this point. Um, an AES for a project of this scale is a very significant undertaking. Um, preparing an AES like that involves a lot of experts who all need to be able to feed in and whose work needs to be 
integrated and coordinated and some of that work needs to feed into other members of the, the specialist team. So um, it's not sort of something that gets done overnight or particularly quickly. Um, by the time this CES goes on exhibition, um, as our understanding is somewhere around the middle of next year, it'll be close to two years since the minister decided that the AES is required. That sort of time frame is not uncommon. Um, it happens, you know, as I said, we've got AES is still in preparation that the minister required um, four years or more ago. So uh, there is a lot of complexity to these investigations and um, as a general rule, I, I think proponents don't take longer about them than they need to, but some of those investigations are, pardon me, are often quite complex and, uh, and need multiple stages to be able to get to a point where the information is sufficiently robust and sufficiently comprehensive um, to be in a form that's that's appropriate to uh, to share with uh, with stakeholders and and other parties. Thank you so much, Jack, for the Q and A. We are just on the allotted time for our session, so thank you so much for your time, Jack. It's been wonderful having you present and answer those questions. It's my pleasure and I'm, I'm, you know, I hope it's been useful for people and if questions occur to people um, five minutes after the session ends, which is not unknown, um, I'm happy for those to be forwarded to me and to try to respond to them as best I can as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. So just to let everyone know, um, we have a couple more sessions planned and our next one is going to be on Thursday the 25th of November, which is titled Understanding Renewable Energy Zones in Western Victoria. And further details about this session are available on our website. If you have any suggestions or topics or agencies that you would like to hear from in relation to the Western Victoria Transmission Network project, feel, please feel free to send us your ideas. Again, you can leave uh, some comments for us on our website as well as provide some feedback for today's session and for future sessions. And on that note, thank you everyone again for joining us. We really hope you found the session valuable and have a great evening.